The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, Realizing a New Train of Thought, Essay 11, Structural Classism, The State and War, Part 1. Quote, Man is the only patriot. He sets himself apart in his own country, under his own flag, and sneers at the other nations, and keeps multitudinous uniformed assassins on hand at heavy expense to grab slices of other people's countries and keep them from grabbing slices of his. And in the intervals between campaigns, he washes the blood of his hands and works for the universal brotherhood of man with his mouth. End quote, Mark Twain. Overview. Human conflict has been a consistent characteristic of society since the beginning of recorded history. While justifications of this have ranged from assumptions of immutable human propensities towards aggression and territoriality to the religious notion of polarized metaphysical powers at work, such as forces of good and evil, history has revealed that cases of conflict generally have rational correlation to environmental circumstances and or cultural conditions. From the immediate fearful stress reaction of our fight or flight propensity to the calm calculated planning of strategic national warfare, there is always a reason for such conflict and the general public's interest to reduce conflict naturally requires we fully assess causality as deeply as we can to consider tangible solutions. This essay will examine two general categories of warfare, imperial warfare and class warfare. While perhaps seemingly different, it will be argued that the root psychological mechanisms of these two categorizations are basically the same, along with how some of the actual mechanisms of battle are actually much more elusive or covert than many recognize. Overall, the central thesis is that the source of these seemingly immutable realities resides within the socio-economic premise itself, in the context of a certain reinforced psychology and hence sociological schemata, not rigid determinations in our genes or lack of some moral aptitude. Put another way, these present realities are not fueled by ideologically isolated groups such as for example, a rogue country's government, or some exceptionally greedy business mentality, but rather by the most fundamental underlying values inherent to virtually everyone's lives in the current socioeconomic condition we perpetuate as culturally normal. The only difference is the degree to which these values are harnessed and for what purpose. Imperial War, Rise of the State. The Neolithic Revolution, some 12,000 years ago, marked a pivotal turning point for human society as it transitioned us from almost exclusively living off the land, limited to the habitat's natural regeneration, to an accelerating trend of environmental control and resource manipulation. The development of agriculture and the creation of labor easing tools was the beginning of what can be observed today where the spectrum of the human capacity to utilize science for the alteration of the world for our advantage appears virtually unlimited. However, this initially slow technological adaptation has set in motion certain patterns and changes which have arguably generated many of the problems we recognize as all too common today. An example would be how imbalance through relative poverty and economic stratification has taken hold as an apparent consequence of this new capacity. In the words of neuroscientist and anthropologist Dr. Robert Sapolsky, hunter-gatherers had thousands of wild sources of food to subsist on. Agriculture changed all that, generating an overwhelming reliance on a few dozen food sources, 
agriculture allowed for the stockpiling of surplus resources, and thus, inevitably, the unequal stockpiling of them, stratification of society, and the invention of classes. Thus, it has allowed for the invention of poverty. Likewise, the rather nomadic lifestyle of the hunter-gatherer slowly became replaced with settled protectionist tribes and then eventually localized city-type societies. In the words of Richard A. Gabriel in the work A Short History of War, the invention and spread of agriculture coupled with the domestication of animals in the 5th millennium BC are acknowledged as the developments that set the stage for the emergence of the first large-scale, complex urban societies. These societies, which appeared almost simultaneously around 4000 BC in both Egypt and Mesopotamia, used stone tools, but within 500 years, stone tools and weapons gave way to bronze. With bronze manufacture came a revolution in warfare. This is also the period that the concept of the state as we know it and the permanence of the armed force emerged. Gabriel continues, <clears throat> These early societies produced the first examples of state governing institutions, initially as centralized chiefdoms and later as monarchies. At the same time, centralization demanded the creation of an an administrative structure capable of directing social activity and resources toward communal goals. The development of central state institutions and a supporting administrative apparatus inevitably gave form and stability to military structures. The result was the expansion and stabilization of the formerly loose and unstable warrior castes. By 2700 BC, in Sumer, there was a fully articulated military structure and standing army organized along modern lines. The standing army emerged as a permanent part of the social structure and was endowed with strong claims to social legitimacy, and that it has been with us ever since. Imperial War Illusions Imperialism is defined as the policy, practice, or advocacy of, of extending the power and dominion of a nation, especially by direct territorial acquisitions or by gaining indirect control over the political or economic life of other areas. While traditional culture might generally think of imperial war as a variation of war in general, assuming other forms of armed national conflict, it is argued here that the root basis of all national wars are actually imperial in nature. The literally thousands of wars in recorded human history have had to do mostly with the acquisition of resources or territory where one group is either working to expand its power and material wealth or working to protect itself from others trying to conquer and absorb their power and wealth. Even many historical conflicts, which on the surface appear to be for the purposes of pure ideology, are often actually hidden imperial economic moves. The Christian Crusades of the 11th century, for example, are often defined as strictly religious conflicts or expressions of ideological fervor. Yet a deeper investigation reveals a powerful undertone of trade expansion and resource acquisition under the guise of the religious war. This is not to say that religions have not been a source of tremendous conflict historically, but to show that there is often an oversimplification found in many historical texts with the economic relevance often missed or ignored. Regardless, the notion of the moral crusade as a form of cover for national economic imperialism continues to this day. In fact, there is a deeply coercive tendency witnessed throughout 
history when it comes to gaining public support for the act of national warfare. For instance, a cursory review of history will find that all offensive acts of war, meaning war initiated by a given power for whatever reason, not a response to direct invasion, originate from the constituents and associates of the governmental body, not the citizenry. Wars tend to begin with some kind of announced suggestion emanating from state power, then fueled by the corporate state-supported media, with the citizenry slowly groomed to appreciate the suggestion. It also helps the state a great deal if there is some form of emotionally striking provocation as well, which can be manipulated to further justify the intended war. Such tactics for the manipulation of a citizenry can take many forms. The use of fear, honor, patriotic paternalism, morality, and the common defense are likely the most common ploys. In fact, invariably, all acts of war are justified as defensive in the public sphere, even if there is no rational, tangible public threat to be found. Yet there is indeed a core truth to this notion of defensive war, <clears throat> since acts of imperial mobilization are based on a very real, yet obscure form of economic and or political fear, the fear of losing control or power. In other words, while there may not be a very real oh. in other words while there may not be a direct immediate threat to a given aggressor nation the long-term competitive need to continually resecure its existing power from possible future loss is a very real and founded fear so in effect this defense is that of elitist, upper-class self-preservation, and hence usually morally unjustifiable to the public in its true terms. Hence these ploys are used instead to gain public approval. Economist and sociologist Thorsten Veblen, in his famous 1917 work, An Inquiry into the Nature of Peace and the Terms of its Perpetuation, wrote the following on the subject of public persuasion. Quote, any warlike enterprise that is hopeful to be entered on moat any warlike enterprise that is hopeful to be entered on must have the moral sanction of the community or of an effective majority in the community. It consequently becomes the first concern of the warlike statesman to put this moral force in train for the adventure on which he is bent. And there are two main lines of motivation, the preservation or the furtherance of the community's material interest, real or fancied, and vindication of the national honor. To these should perhaps be added a third, the advancement and perpetuation of the nation's culture." End quote. This last point on the perpetuation of the nation's culture is best exemplified with the common modern Western imperial claims of seeking to spread freedom and democracy. This claim takes a paternal position, positing the idea that the current political climate of a targeted nation is simply too inhumane and intervention to help its citizens becomes a moral obligation of the invading power. Veblen continues, Any patriotism will serve as ways and means to warlike enterprise under competent management, even if the people are not habitually prone to a bellicose temper. Rightly managed, ordinary patriotic sentiment may readily be mobilized for warlike adventure by any reasonably adroit and single-minded body of statesmen, of which there is abundant illustration. It is also quite a safe generalization that when hostilities have once been got fairly underway by the interested statesmen, the patriotic sentiment of the nation may confidently be counted on to back the enterprise irrespective of the merits of the quarrel. 
In America, the phrase, I'm against the war but support the troops, is, uh, is common among those who oppose a given conflict but wish to be viewed as still respectful of their country in general. This phrase is unique, as it is actually irrational. To logically support the troops would mean to support the role of being a troop, hence the acts that are required by that role. The implicit gesture, of course, is that one supports the need for war and hence supports the men and women of the armed forces who assist that need. Yet the statement itself is fully contradictory and exists as a form of doublethink, as to disagree with the existence of a certain war is to wholly disagree with actions of those who engage it. It is similar to saying I'm against cancer killing people, but I support cancer's right to life. The armed forces have historically been held in high public esteem by a citizenry, and the government continually glorifies this to the extent that the as assumption of honor takes on an irrational life of its own. In fact, it is compounded psychologically by a built-in ceremonialism. Honor is formalized through awards, medals, parades, postures of respect, and other adornments which impress the public as to the supposed value of the actions of the soldiers, and hence the institution of war. This further reinforces the cultural taboo, where to insult any element of the war apparatus is seen as showing disrespect for the sacrifice of the armed forces. From the standpoint of true protection and problem resolution, as would be the honorable case of a firefighter who saves a child from a burning building, this admiration is warranted. The selfless, altruistic position of putting one's life at risk for the benefit of another is naturally a noble act. However, in the context of historical warfare, the personal altruism of a soldier does not justify broad acts of national imperial aggression, no matter how well-intentioned the soldiers may be. Furthermore, this fear-oriented power preservation by the established governmental apparatus also naturally generates a sub-war against the domestic citizenry itself, almost always amplified in times of war, those who challenge or oppose a given national conflict have historically been met with direct oppression and by cultural extension, public resentment. <clears throat> the common yet ambiguous legal violations of treason and sedition are historical examples of this along with the pattern of suspending the rights of citizens during times of war, sometimes even including free speech. Socially, the use of patriotism, as noted before, is also very common to the effect that those who do not support a war are often dismissed as not supporting the national citizenry by extension, creating alienation. More recently, those in opposition and perhaps engaging in protest actions have been considered terrorists by the state, a powerful incrimination with severe legal consequences if deemed true by the authorities. However, this sub-war can be deconstructed into an even deeper mechanism, what could be called a kind of social control in support of imperial intent. In many countries today, either by obligation from birth or by persuasion to legally binding contracts. The pressure or motivation to join the military itself is manipulative on many levels. Advertising tactics, such as money for college or personal accomplishment are common, arguably targeting the lower rungs of the economic hierarchy. The United States is on record for having at times spent billions a year 4.7 billion in 2009 on global public relations in assist public image and recruitment. Imperial War Source
When the traditional propagandized illusions in defense of the act of organized human murder and resource theft have been overridden, dismissing such shallow justifications as paternal patriotism, patriotism, honor, and protectionism, we find that war today is actually an inherent characteristic of the property scarcity-driven business system. It would be false to say that war is a product of capitalism in and of itself, since the practice of war predates capitalism extensively. However, when we deconstruct the premise itself, we see that war is, indeed, a central, immutable feature of capitalism, as it is simply a more sophisticated manifestation of these same divisive, competitive, archaic values and practices. Just as a corporation competes with other corporations of the same genre for income survival, invariably seeking monopoly and cartel when it can, all governments on the planet are fundamentally premised on the same form of survival. By extension, using America as a case study, in 2011, the country gained about $2.3 trillion in federal income tax revenues alone. These revenues are important to the operation of what is, in effect, the business institution known as America. In the same way, the annual earnings of Microsoft affect its ability to function. America is, in truth, a corporation in function and form, with all the registered businesses existing in its domestic legal web to be considered subsidiaries of this parent institution we traditionally call the U.S. government. Therefore, all actions of the U.S. government, along with all competing governments in the world, must naturally keep an acute business acumen in operation. However, what separates this parent corporation, America, from its subsidiary sectors, corporations, is the scale of its capacity to preserve itself and keep a competitive edge. Its necessity to preserve the core drivers of its economy is crucial, and a cursory glance at history regarding how the U.S. was able to gain and maintain its status of a global empire, shows this business acumen clearly. The manifestation is really little different in principle than how a specific corporation seeks to gain a commercial monopoly. Only in this case, the ideal of global monopoly, empire, is not restricted by legal mandate, as is commonly claimed by the domestic legal restraint. It is forcefully executed in the theater of imperial war. In fact, interestingly enough, but not unexpectedly, the very act of this self-preservation through military might have itself become a powerfully lucrative business venture, which often improves the economic state of the nation and hence profits to its corporate constituents. Today we can extend these economic benefits to the massive military expenditures. Along with the reconstruction of war-torn areas by the conquering states, commercial subsidiaries, the slow prodding of a country's integrity through trade tariffs, sanctions, and debt impositions for the sake of populations, subjugation for the benefit of transcontinental industries, and many other modern economic war conventions. This point was likely best expressed by one of America's most decorated army officers of the 20th century, Major General Smedley D. Butler. Butler was the author of a famous book released after World War I titled War as a Racket and stated the following with respect to the business of war. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. He also wrote in 1935, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street, and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. 
I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. John A. Hobson's monumental work of imperialism, a study described the tendency as a social parasitic process by which a moneyed interest within the state, usurping the reins of government, makes for imperial expansion in order to fasten economic suckers into foreign bodies so as to drain them of their wealth in order to support domestic luxury. Now many would think about these acts of abuse as a form of corruption, but this reasoning is difficult to justify in the broad view. The ethical and moral argument of fair and unfair has no cogent integrity within the system framework inherent to capitalism. This is one of the unfortunate failures of realization by those who are active in the message of world peace or anti-war activism, but yet still defend the competitive market model. In other words, world peace appears simply not a possibility within the currently accepted model of economic practice. Every step of the application of global capitalism, starting from its European inception, has been associated with vast violence, exploitation, and subjugation. European colonialism, the capture of African slaves for use in sale, the forced subjugation of countless colonial peoples and the creation of privileged sanctuaries of profiteering and power for the many government created or government protected businesses only touches the surface of its inherent character as a war system of thought. Thorsten Veblen, again writing from 1917, makes the direct connection to what he called the pecuniary or monetary foundation of war. It has appeared in the course of the argument that the pre preservation of the present pecuniary law and order, with all its incident of ownership and investment, is incompatible with an unwarlike state of peace and security. This current scheme of investment, business, and industrial sabotage should have an appreciably better chance of survival in the long run if the present conditions of warlike preparation and national insecurity were maintained, or if the projected peace were left in a somewhat problematic state, sufficiently precarious to keep national animosities alert. So. If the projectors of this peace at large are in any degree inclined to seek concessive terms on what the peace might hopefully be made enduring, it should evidently be part of their endeavors from the outset to put events in train for the present abatement and eventual abrogation of the rights of ownership and of the price system in which these rights take effect. Further evidence of this context can be found in the more modern forms of indirect violence. These include economic warfare approaches, as mentioned before, which can serve as complete acts of aggression in and of themselves, or as a part of a procedural prelude to traditional military action. Examples come in the form of trade, tariffs, sanctions, debt by coercion, and many other lesser-known covert methods to weaken a country. 
Global financial institutions such as the World Bank and IMF have heavy vested state and hence business interests behind them, and they have the power to allocate debt to bail out suffering countries at the expense of the quality of life of its citizenry, often taking charge of natural resources or industries through select privatization or other manners which can weaken a country's ability to the effect that it becomes reliant on others to the advantage of commercial outsiders. This is simply a more covert manner of subjugation than was seen, say, with the British Empire's imperial expansion through its East India Company. The commercial force that took advantage of the newly conquered regional resources and labor in Asia in the 17th century. However, unlike British Empire expansion, American Empire expansion did not gain its status through military action alone even though such a presence is still enormous globally. Rather, the use of complex economic strategies that repositioned other countries into subjugation to U.S. economic and geoeconomic interests was made common. <laughs>